I just wanted to do a quick sort of um, introduction to what we're, we're doing here um, and to um, lay the groundwork for the panel. So um, we want each of you to take, each of the panelists to take about um, three minutes to introduce yourself. And in particular, with a focus on your current position, just briefly describe what you do, what opportunities at UW that helped you prepare for this transition or to get this job because all of the postdocs who are on are at UW and I'm sure they'd like to know what kinds of resources there are here and then what you wish you knew while you were a postdoc as you're thinking about this transition. So I think to get started we're going to do a poll for the participants. So Jane are you going to take that away? I just launched it. Yep, okay, so the participants, if you could um, fill out the poll. Can the um, panelists fill that out too? No, okay. Very explicit statement at the bottom. <laughs> ah, okay, okay. Hosts and panelists can't vote. I suppose we could say what school department we were involved in yeah. <laughs> previously. Let me give our intros. Yeah, that's probably a good idea, actually. <laughs> okay, we're getting some participation. So far, SAFS is winning. Yeah, I think we have one ocean, couple of oceanographers, somebody from ESS and a couple of atmospheric scientists on the panel. SAFS is still winning, then atmospheric sciences and oceanography coming up behind. Luann, you could use the tally of votes perhaps to decide which panelist goes first. Yeah, we don't have a SAFS person on the on the panel, so that makes it difficult. Um, <laughs> most people are interested in exploring their future options. Um, data science is a big one and climate science in terms of um, things are people are interested in exploring. So um, why don't we get started and people can continue um, filling out the poll as you uh, go in. So what we're gonna do is just go around and I'm gonna go in the order that I see you on the screen. So we'll start with Fritz, try to keep it brief, just a few minutes. Go ahead, Fritz. Thank you. Um, so I was, uh, I got my degree and did my postdoc at the School of Oceanography. So I'm a through and through ocean person. Uh, a, I, my current position is to help run a small instrument company, MRV Systems. Uh, we make autonomous underwater vehicles, um, aka drones, people love that term for some reason. Uh, um, we were founded about a decade ago, we're 10 years old. And uh, a lot of our products are used in the Argo program for uh, surveying the upper half of the ocean. Um, we were founded based on a uh, uh, spin out from Scripps Institute of Oceanography, one of the other big institutions. Um, and we uh, contract for, with them for uh, lots, of, lots of their uh, solo product. Um, so, uh, but we do special projects and we have a lot of academic and agency customers, uh, Woods Hole, NOAA, um, APL, UW, APL, Navy. So we're, we're, in, the, we're in the business of, of making instruments to collect data. Um, while I was a postdoc uh, at UW, one of the best things that my advisor did there for me uh, was to bring me in to help do what I was really uh, trained a lot to do as a graduate student, which is operational oceanography, in this case on hydrothermal vent research. So it was a community that I admired because of the interdisciplinary nature of it. There was 
chemists and biologists and geologists, but there really weren't any physical oceanographers. So I got to be one of the first. <laughs> um, and he gave me the ability to kind of uh, run a, uh, a bunch of experiments that he had uh, gotten granted uh, while he spent a lot of his time uh, being an administrator in the department. Um, but that, you know, that was one of the great things that he did was to give me that ability to work in this interdisciplinary community and to work with one of the, the best uh, autonomous underwater vehicles of the time, uh, an instrument called Abe that was by Witzel. And um, as far as what I wish I knew while I was a postdoc, it was probably how hard it is to complete publications uh, after you start doing something else. <laughs> um, it's been, it's been really hard to kind of go back and finish those things up. Uh, that's, that's for sure. So um, anyway, that's, so there's my three minutes. Thanks Fritz. Um, Jessica, are you, you want to go next? Yeah, absolutely. So I'm Jessica London. I'm a principal data scientist at Salesforce. And that's probably not a company you may have heard of. Um, they advertise in the uh, New York Times, but, but it's enterprise software. Um, so it's a lot of what's called CRM. It's customer management services. Um, it's, it's basically everything when you get the email coming from the shoe company, you go online and you buy the shoes. It's all of that software. Um, and actually Salesforce just bought Tableau last year. So um, something that, that's in our backyard here in Fremont. Um, so what do I do? I'm a data scientist. I basically, I still do research. I publish papers. I just had one published in NeurIPS, which is the sort of premier neural network conference. And I mentor interns, uh, graduate students who are working on their PhDs and mentor them to publish papers. And then I also build products and that's really the number one thing. So um, literally I build software that gets shipped in, in products. Um, so what prepared me? I did a PhD in what was then geophysics, it's now ESS. And I also got a master's in applied math. And it turns out I was doing machine learning back before it was overly hyped, <laughs> uh, working on ridge regressions, if you're familiar with that. And that set me up obviously pretty well to make a transition into um, industry because, um, you know, machine learning and, and now neural networks are, are sort of the rage. Um, also, perhaps more relevant to um, the attendees here is it was contacts that I had from the University of Washington that got me my first job out of a postdoc. So um, exactly what you're doing now as attending here is, is really useful. Um, that was a, a company that doesn't exist anymore called Three Tier. Um, what I wish I knew, I think I would have focused more on software development skills. There's no reason you, know, you can't develop as you go skills. So I did all of my coding in grad school, MATLAB. That's basically not what they use in computer science. It's all Python. Um, I could have potentially um, done all of my coding in Python and that would have set me up. But um, overall things worked out pretty okay. That's all I got. Great, Allison. Yeah, hi, um, I'm Allison Smith. I. Um, I'll give a little bit of my background first. I got my PhD uh, in biology, um, a PhD and a master's in biology. Um, and then I didn't, and I switched to doing more oceanographic work as a postdoc. Um, so I have a bit of an interdisciplinary background. Um, and I was in the oceanography department as a postdoc at the University of Washington. Um, currently, I'm a senior data scientist at DocuSign. Um, and so uh, in terms of DocuSign, like what we do, uh, it's, you may have actually signed something that came from DocuSign, um, but you know, like often it's, you know, you get, it's like, it's a secure agreement. So basically it's e-signature. So uh, someone will send you a document and you sign it and it's the equivalent of you signing it on a piece of paper. Uh, and DocuSign has been around um, quite a long time, uh, but but data science is actually really new to the company. So it was primarily just a software company where they were building software um, and they really care about deep, like security. Um, it's like a big thing for them. Um, they want their customers to trust them. 
And they, you know, if you send a document through DocuSign, it is very well encrypted. No one's looking at it. It's not Google. <laughs> um, so it's super secure. Um, and also like data kind of falls in the category of like, you know, like trying to keep things secure. So it's only recently that they're like, well, we probably should be doing some more data stuff. Um, and so trying to balance between, you know, the security um, that is needed um, that keeps the, you know, that is part of what DocuSign does, but also um, making the company more data driven. Uh, and so to that fact, I'm on a, a fairly new team. Uh, and so a lot of it is just building the groundwork um, in terms of even just getting the data available to use in sort of modeling um, kind of work. Um, and so it's a, it's a very uh, sort of nascent uh, process. And I actually kind of like that stage of like, hey, it's not like, you know, like someone else did everything and then you come in, you're actually kind of laying the foundation for the data science team. Um, and to that effect, um, I do a mix of different things. I, so I'm helping, um, I'm on the, working on the product. Uh, and so uh, I can give an example of like one of the things um, that I've done is like, if you were actually sending um, one of these documents to get signed uh, and you, um, we're labeling it with, you can, you can drag these tags with like the signature. Um, and so basically they added a new tag. And so one of the things I did was um, as they were launching it sort of provided insights into how that launch was going. Um, so that's um, sort of one of the things that I do um, also laying the foundation for um, how we're going to do analytics and modeling in the future. Uh, in terms of things from or things that you dub um, that really helped me is I was uh, also a postdoc in the eScience Institute. And so that sort of exposed me uh, to uh, the, that there were opportunities in industry. Uh, and so I was able to talk to a lot of people there. They brought in um, people from industry to give talks. Uh, and so uh, it was my really first exposure to anything in industry and like things that you could do and like skills that could translate. Um, so that was kind of really key for me, even sort of like thinking about industry as an option. Um, in terms of things that I wish I knew, uh, SQL would have been really helpful. Uh, everything is done in SQL. Um, and the other thing would have been, and I kind of knew this going into, into industry, was that like in academia, you do things very independently um, in GitHub. Like you might be using GitHub, but most of the time you're using it just by yourself. Um, and it's a very different process when you have to work as a team uh, on a shared set of code. Um, and so like just getting those dynamics right of like, you know, like just getting the rhythm of like how you go through that process um, is also something I think would have been really helpful early on um, as well. Um, but yeah. Great, thanks. Okay, Kelly, take it away. Hi, uh, I'm Kelly McCusker. Uh, I got my PhD in atmospheric science um, a while ago, and then I did a postdoc um, at University of Victoria, and then I took that like project to the University of Washington. Uh, so that's how I finished that postdoc at UW. Um, right now, I'm a senior climate scientist uh, at an independent research firm called Rhodium Group, and we do um, the side of the business that I'm on is the energy and climate side, and we do energy policy analysis, and we study physical climate risk as well. Um, and then the other cool thing is that we're a part of a collaboration called the Climate Impact Lab, which is um, basically economists, climate scientists, and data scientists from Berkeley, University of Chicago, and Rutgers. And the mission of the Climate Impact Lab is to compute the um, like the cost of climate change at a local level, and then use that information uh, for different sectors of the economy to compute, come up with a new social cost of carbon number, which is like a policy relevant number used at the federal level to do cost benefit analysis. Um, so I, I'm in charge of managing like climate science research with the lab, and then also in charge of um, managing some, some rhodium projects. A lot of the research that we do at the impact lab kind of gets fed into the rhodium group side of the business, the climate risk um, side of things. So I, I both manage like long-term research projects and I do analytical work myself on like uh, communications projects and things like that. Um, 
so let's see. So uh, my postdoc experience at UW was a little bit different, as I mentioned, because I kind of took a project from UVic to UW. And so I was pretty connected with my Canadian colleagues. Uh, and I also had a new baby. So it was a bit of a complicated time. Um, but I will say that the sort of the support that I received in looking at all options after my postdoc was like really invaluable. Um, and knowing uh, that they, you know, at least in the Department of Atmospheric Sciences, there was some encouragement for looking at um, non-academic work. And so it was, that was um, really helpful. Um, as far as skills are concerned, it was really invaluable for me to have learned Python during my postdoc. I, um, that's the language I use now, and I know that that's kind of the language of data science these days. So that was really helpful. Um, and then things I wish I'd known, um, I was going to take a little bit of a different tack on this question, which is that uh, I did not realize how much of an impact you can have, like, at a, a private sector company. And I mean that in, as far as, like, I feel that where, where I work now, we have um, we might be able to, like, affect policy really closely or, um, you know, change the conversation on climate change, which are things that are really important to me. So I didn't know that that was – maybe I was just being naive, but I didn't know that that was possible um, from the private sector. So that's been really cool. Um, yeah, so that's all. Great. Okay, last but not least, Andy. Sure. Okay, so uh, I'm Andy Runs. Uh, I – did my PhD in applied math, but really um, was doing climate dynamics at the time. Uh, I did a postdoc in atmospheric sciences, uh, and that was in ending in 2018. Uh, and I'm now a senior data scientist at Netflix, where I work in experimentation uh, for an area we call streaming delivery. Uh, so that's everything that happens after you press play, sort of everything that has to do with the actual video streaming. Uh, so I I've, I've largely act as an internal consultant for teams that want to test or measure things. So there are a lot of engineering stakeholders uh, across the company who um, run tons of A-B tests um, and do, do other things that require statistical expertise. Uh, and the, the biggest single thing that I do is own the, the streaming uh, video experimentation platform, uh, the system for, for basically doing statistical inference on these big experiments that we run. Um, but ultimately, I do kind of wear a lot of hats uh, and have the, the freedom to work on a lot of a uh, wide variety of different things. So that, that ranges from uh, basic research on stats and computational techniques to uh, sometimes driving ev evidence gathering for kind of bigger changes to the Netflix product. So that can involve uh, m things like memo writing. So you don't totally escape the uh, process of writing paper like things. Um, and then at the extreme um, doing kind of more operational stuff. So this year I've been working a lot with trying to prevent the internet from imploding on itself during COVID, uh, which has been really fun. <laughs> um, so in, in terms of uh, opportunities at the UW that helped me to prepare to make the transition, I think that the single biggest thing uh, anywhere is just being around smart people, uh, which there are obviously many at the UW. And so I, I got a lot out of talking to everyone in my department, but also um, statisticians in the stats department and people in computer science. Um, you know, it was, it was very easy to find time to learn things from a, a lot of different people. Um, the other thing I liked is just having the flexibility of being a postdoc means you're sort of the master of your own destiny. It's the first time you're kind of like dropped into the deep end by yourself. You don't have uh, the same level of oversight. Um, and so that, that also gave me space to learn the new skills that I knew I would need to pick up uh, if I was going to be moving to industry. So I think that prepared me well for working um, at Netflix, which is like a super flat organization where you really have to be, um, you know, uh, making making the right connections and talking to the right people to, to get things done. Um, and for what I wish I knew when I were postdoc, the biggest thing is actually just how like quickly things move in industry and particularly for the kind of like process of once you get an interview uh, assuming you get a job, like the whole thing is very quick and can easily be less than a month. And so I had this, these kind of timelines in my head and kept telling people like, oh, maybe, maybe I'll think about it in three months after I'm done organizing this workshop or something. Uh, but when it came down to it, like, you know, uh, I think the time from interview to like, they wanted me to be there was like two or three weeks. Um, so it, things just move. This is just a very different pace. And that was the biggest kind of um, shock. Uh, but I think also 
I'd echo something that, that Jessica mentioned. I think Allison also mentioned um, things like SQL are really valuable to know and they sound boring, but they're really fun and they change your way of thinking about data. Um, and some of the fancier things like deep learning are not necessary for most industry roles, uh, just basic stats um, and, and things like SQL are, are much more important when you're getting started. Cool, okay, great. So I think we're gonna open it up to questions. Um, the first question is that some, um, we in the poll, um, we asked the participants that they were, what subjects they were particularly interested in. And um, people said, a lot of people said climate science, data science, remote sensing techniques. Um, so the technology end, human dimensions and user experience. And then there was a group that said other. And I'd be curious if um, some of the participants wanna raise their hand and um, say what other kinds of things you might be interested in um, to ask the panelists, or if there's any other questions for the panelists, just go ahead and either raise your hand or put it in the question. So someone asked, um, how did you expand your network without uh, weirdly cold calling folks, networking events, how to find someone who knows the someone? Any advice for that from you non-academics? I mean, I can start, I guess. Um, so... I took a few different approaches. So I used my contacts. I've already mentioned the eScience Institute um, and that included a lot of people in the computer science department um, and they have a lot more connections to industry um, than, 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 than my colleagues in oceanography. Um, so, uh, you know, cause they are sending, I mean, a lot of their PhD students actually plan to go to industry. So they're much more familiar with that process um, I also did the Insight Data Science Fellows Program, um, which is like a seven week, you know, basically interview training program, which uh, basically is, yeah, is what I said, is interview training. You should have already have the skills, but like since, you know, as um, academics, we don't really, aren't really prepared for the industry type interviews. Um, so that was really helpful, but also part of that was networking, both of the people who you were in the program with who are also gonna get jobs in industry and would be like potential contacts going forward. But also in terms of, they have a larger network of people who'd already been through the program before. And then also they were doing some of the networking for you because they were wanting you to get a job. Um, and so, um, and as part of that process, uh, uh, there's things that I learned about, like there's a lot of Python meetups um, and I went to some of those as well in terms of just, and I would actually just go up to someone and be like, hey, I'm looking for a job. I'm coming from academia. You know, who in this room should I meet? Like, I would just ask somebody who else I should meet. Like, I would also like talk to them, but like, I would, act, you know, I would never with them and then ask them who I should talk to next. Like, cause I didn't know it was like 50 people and they would always were really friendly and were like, hey, that person over there is a really great person to talk to. They work at such and such place. And so then I would go um, make an effort to talk to that person. Uh, I would also recommend uh, going to professional society meetings. Um, so in, in my business, the uh, Marine Technology Society or IEEE Ocean Engineering Society are both hold meetings all the time. They, they hold now webinars, but those are great places. Uh, people expect to meet folks who are looking for, you know, positions or they might be there actually with a, you know, job in their back pocket looking for somebody. So um, the professional societies in whatever field you're interested in, I think, are well worth uh, using for, for that kind of contact. So there's another question now um, from Drew. How long moving into industry did you start preparing for the transition in terms of learning new skills, um, timelines? Um, maybe in retrospect, you could think about what the ideal timeline would be. No, Andy, you want to start off? Yeah, in, in retrospect, I started uh, like probably two or three years beforehand because I started to get interested in things like machine learning mostly by accident. And, you know, I just, I needed to use some stuff for a project I was working on where like um, hidden Markov models worked really well. And uh, I just got, you know, bitten by that. But um, in terms of like the more immediate skill set, um, probably a couple months, probably like three, 
three to six months beforehand. And um, I wish I had started it a bit sooner. I think the interviewing skills are super important. Um, and, you know, I tried one interview early on that I, I thought I could wing it because I was like, oh, I've been interviewing for academic jobs. Like, surely this will be OK. And I just completely, completely bombed it because I wasn't prepared for any of the types of questions that would be asked. Um, so, you know, at that point, I hadn't prepared. And then I spent like, yeah, maybe three months, like really kind of focusing and actually studying things from like basic stats uh, that, that um, you know, I just didn't know the kind of trivia question things, which, you know, it's, it's a bit of a game, but it is important for getting your foot in the door, I think. Jessica, do you want to add anything to that? Yeah, um, I guess I would just highlight that for the postdoc attendees, like you have such an advantage because you already know how to learn and how to teach yourself. And, and that's, that's awesome. Um, it will require skills to get into data science. That's all I know um, that are, are specific to industry, but there's some great blogs. A friend of mine at Nordstrom wrote a great one on how to prepare for data science interviews. And um, there's online classes, there's, there's ways that you can sort of supplement or refresh those stats skills and things that, that really do help because um, I will also agree the interview itself is its own skill. So one question is um, for Andy or anyone else, what types of questions did they ask you or were there questions that were surprising when you actually got into the interview? Yeah, it can vary a lot, but it's nice to, there are a lot of kind of fairly standard things out there that are, there really are like trivia questions. Like, have you ever seen this trick problem before is basically the question. <laughs> um, so I think the one that I really stumbled on in that first interview I did was like some weird Monty Hall type problem thing. And I just couldn't remember how to like actually solve it in real time um, with someone who had planned the whole thing out. And I try not to ask those types of questions myself, but they're very common. And they're, they're pretty Googleable. So there are sites like Glassdoor that will give you tons of example interview questions. Um, and yeah, lots of blog posts out there too. And you do learn a lot in the process of studying as well. So it's not completely uh, mindless, yeah. <laughs> um, I just wanna add, oftentimes you'll be asked to use really bad coding software for the coding interviews. Um, and that can be like a really tricky point. You're like, I know how to do this, but the software isn't doing exactly what I want it to do. So like one of the things is just to prepare on all of them and just, um, and one, like that happened to me, it just like the software wasn't working. And like, I just was like, if this was working, this was what I would do, you know, just like sort of practice, like if that kind of stuff, you know, like isn't, you know, the coding interview software isn't working or something like that, but just be prepared for like those kind of things as well. So um, I'm not sure Marie has a question. Oh, I'm gonna allow her to talk. Go ahead, Marie. Um, hi, thanks everyone for participating in this panel. I guess like zooming out just a little bit, um, I think probably a lot of us are sitting here listening to your suggestions and you're like, okay, I'm approximately like qualified to find a job in industry, but can you guys give any advice on sort of big picture how to sort of change our, the way that we maybe like um, represent ourselves, not necessarily just like how to reformat a CV, but almost more like, like how, how do you think about all of the things that you do as a scientist and like flip that so that you can make those sort of skills like intriguing for an industry job, if that makes sense. Uh, thanks. That's a super good question. And um, I think you, you're you already nailing it. Like in industry, it's all about storytelling and particularly with data science and coming up with your story. Um, you know, at this point going through a postdoc, you know, we all went through slightly circuitous paths, but you have to weave it together in a way that makes sense uh, for, for what you're applying for. Yeah, I would second that. I, I think um, understanding why you're looking out, you know, outside of academia, right? I mean, a lot of the traditional path is PhD, postdoc, academic job. But now you're doing something different. Why? And if you can explain that why in a cogent and convincing manner to the people you're talking to in industry, that, help, that goes a long way. 
um, to really to really making your case as to why you should join their company or they should want you and their company uh, to do what they're looking what they need to have somebody do. Kelly, did you want to add something to that? Yeah, um, I was just going to say that um, one of the things that like what a good thing to do um, as you're trying to like reevaluate what you have done and how you can present that to the world is like thinking about what kinds of skills might be, you know, desirable um, in, in industry, like managing projects, working independently, being a quick learner and thinking about how you can turn all the things that you've done as your, during your degree and as a postdoc, like into discrete, like uh, evidence of skills that you have, even though you haven't worked in industry before, you know, you may have organized a meeting or you've, you know, published papers, which is like, writing and communicating and then you've given presentations so a lot of it I think like showing you know kind of being able to manage um you know one long-term project that on its own is really like uh evidence of, of being like a good you would probably be a good employee but um but also if you have like side projects so managing multiple projects and um keeping timelines and um yeah so just being able to like organize things and all those skills sound really mundane but they're actually really useful when you're interviewing for industry type jobs um so yeah just thinking about like what are the things that you did in um in your postdoc and in, in grad school that you could just say like oh i did you know i taught a class of 10 people that means i had to develop the curriculum i had to manage this class i had to do grades like all those things are really um useful any any other questions or follow-ons, Marie? Or I assume if you don't unmute, it means you're okay. Um, so, uh, can I have one one more thought yeah, on sure. that too? Actually, um, so I, there's also like I, I would recommend just kind of channeling the persona that you use if you're giving a big talk at a conference, and in the sense that like. Um, you know, I've interviewed people who are otherwise awesome, but who like come to an interview wearing sweatpants and like <laughs> just really basic stuff, you know, that, 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 um, you know, it's, it's really easy to shoot yourself in the foot with, with, um, little things. And so just like checking all the boxes that, that not, not just for a data science interview standpoint, but just basic interviewing standpoint, um, I think is really useful. Um, and the, the other thing is that you have a lot going for you already and that you have a PhD and that is already a big, like a, a, a signal of value and of skills that a lot of people who are recruiting for jobs will see and having done a postdoc even more so. So um, like feel positive about that. Um, I, can I ask one more thing about interviewing? Um, I have found that it's really useful both from like an interviewee perspective but as an interviewer if the person is like not only have they prepared for the interview but they have prepared specifically for that position at your company like and they you know they know the mission statement they know like the background of the company they know exactly what this job is and what questions they have and it's it's very clear that they're interested in that particular job um that's like a that always looks really well um upon the person so like showing enthusiasm and preparedness. Yeah. Um, and I have one last thing to add in that, um, at least in many companies, like a referral, even if it's a, somebody you met once at a, an event like five years ago, but if they remember you and they were willing to refer you, that basically helps you cut the line um, in a lot of ways. Uh, and so, and they, in, and in, you know, it's just like, how the industry process and software works. Uh, and so, you know, don't be shy about reaching out to maybe someone you know at that company. Usually they will get a, if you get hired, they get a financial reward as well. So like they're very motivated to help you go through the process. Um, and so, um, you know, in a lot of ways uh, that can, you know, really help you out. So there's another question from someone. Are you familiar with anyone who has taken an industry position then flipped to government or back to academia? Anyone wanna speak to that? 
I know in engineering, it's not an uncommon thing to happen. Um, and there actually has been sort of on-ramps from industry into academia programs um, through the National Science Foundation and stuff. But um, anyway, yeah. Allison, did you have an idea? Yeah, it happens in computer science quite a bit. Also, like, I feel like in computer science, a lot of the professors were working a lot of their, spending a lot of their time actually at another company, but keeping their professor position at UW. Um, and, you know, but basically they were almost entirely working at another company. Uh, and so I think it happens a little bit more in like a computer science department where that, that occurs. I mean, they, and sometimes they don't even actually let go of their um, ties. I am, but I don't, I'm trying to think, but I, I don't know of any cases um, in like the environmental sciences. So there's a, another question from Drew. Do you want to unmute yourself? Um, or I, I don't know if that's possible. I'll just read it. Specifically to Kelly, but even to others, how important is it to have domain specific knowledge coming in? Specifically, especially in companies that seem to be straddling industry and science a lot, like rhodium. Can someone who is working on ocean phytoplankton advertise themselves to work on energy markets? This seems slightly different from working in general data science and where knowing stats might be the main skill that is needed, but sort of the domain knowledge within the geosciences or environmental sciences. Oh, there he is. Um, did you want to um, expand on that, Dhruv? No, I think I, think I expressed uh, what I needed to in the question. I mean, I hope it comes across. I mean, I don't know if it doesn't make sense. I can rephrase it. But. Anyone want to? Well, um, no, yeah, I can. Kelly. I can take a stab at yeah. at least at rhodium. Um, the example that you gave, Drew, about you know ocean phytoplankton and advertising themselves to work on energy markets um, at rhodium, that it wouldn't work out because we do value domain experience for that kind of thing. Um, so, yeah, I mean, that might not be the answer that you want to hear, but I know that, um, you know, like the climate science uh, domain experience that I had was like really key to me getting this position. And we have since hired, you know, analysts to do energy market research and things like that. And we definitely, val it depends on the level of the position though. Like if it's um, a research analyst, entry level is considered like a master's level. Um, so, it doesn't have to be like really deep domain experience, but some domain experience. I hope that's helpful. How about Fritz? Can you add anything to that? It, it, yeah. Uh, um, in our case, uh, and, and we are actually looking at a couple, bringing on a couple people who are postdocs um, or have been postdocs, that the, it isn't as much uh, the, instrument domain experience in particular as it is the relationship domain so it's the people and how these people work with others in the community so in that case it's it um i think it, it's your experience with uh interacting on committees with going and giving talks at meetings with the rest of the uh scientific community that is you know for us is a is a key component to um, making uh, that position a valuable one to the company uh, because, it, because of those relationships and being able to uh, continue those um, in the, into the future, um, right? And, and making, making us as a company more relevant to the, science, the, the scientific community uh, that is a large part of our customer base. So, yeah. Andy, you put in a comment recently. Do you want to expand on that a bit? Yeah, so I was going to say um, for getting for having domain specific experience, there there are tons of places where it's plausible to like find someone who has experience in like energy or you know something that's represented in academia. But there's so many companies like say Netflix or DocuSign or whatever where there's no academic coverage of, <laughs> of that specific topic. And so it's very hard to find someone with domain experience. And so you have an advantage in those cases. Um, you know that that pool of, of people is basically for us, for example, would be someone who works at YouTube. Um, someone who works at maybe at Amazon um, or, you know, someone who doesn't have that experience, but who can learn. Uh, so, um, you know, other than that, there may be like five or six PhD graduates per year worldwide who are like doing streaming video. So 
um, tiny, it's a tiny pool. And so, yeah, there's, there's at many companies, there's a willingness to like, let people spend some time onboarding. Any other um, comments from, um, or questions from the audience? So looking back over your career and thinking about, you know, um, life after, after academia, I don't know, is there a perspective you have now since all of you are several years at least in working in the private sector and those choices that you made along the line to get you where you are? Um, any thoughts you wanted to share with the postdocs, current postdocs? Kelly's smiling. Do you want to say something? <laughs> <laughs> I have a lot of thoughts and they're just like all over the place, but let's hear um, some of them. Yeah. One of them is that uh, it is very nice. It depends on your job, of course, but I find that I have very good boundaries between work and life now that I don't think would have been possible in academia. Um, partly that's my own just like issue that I have, but um, it's, yeah, having sort of like more concrete goals and more concrete deadlines and more concrete working hours has actually been really nice. Um, so yeah, that's just one perspective that I have. Anyone else? Andy, do you want to add something? Yeah, I agree uh, big time about the work-life balance stuff. But I think also when I was still uh, in academia, I had this view of there being like a single career path and track. And I, that's that's very much gone from my mind now. Like if if uh, if I wanted to go back to academia, um, it, it would be too bad if nobody wanted me. But at the same time, I, I you know, I feel like I want to have a bunch of different jobs and, you know, many like sub careers in my in my life. And uh, and so my perspective on that has very much changed. Jessica. So I remember having a feeling similar to the sentiments expressed about, um, well, if this doesn't work out, then I can go back and, and do this thing. And, and I actually believe that now that it, I could go back with all different skills that would actually be super impactful. And I think that's super exciting. A friend of mine at Google was actually looking at positions at Lawrence Livermore, and he ended up deciding to stay at Google, but he did have offers from both. So there, there are a lot of options to um, move around. Um, I think what I didn't expect from industry is how much I love having different types of projects. Mm -hmm. You can move around different managers. You can even just with the same manager switch what your um, focus is. I've personally worked on um, healthcare related machine learning when I was at Microsoft Research. Now I'm working on entirely different things, design applications uh, for machine learning. And it, it it's, it's really fun um, to even just take from one micro field to the next, those little learnings. Um, I think that it, it's really quite nice to have that flexibility that um, I don't remember feeling that way about my PhD work. Yeah. Um, so there's a there's a question about internships. At the undergraduate level, there are a plethora of internships to get in the door with tech. I'm wondering if there are similar-ish paid opportunities like fellowships that lead to permanent positions, thoughts? And I, I guess I'll say that NSF is recognizing this because they actually have a new program for graduate students where you can get supplemental funding for graduate students to do um, postdocs in industry. I mean, not postdocs, can do summer internships in industry. So I think NSF is aware of this, but are you guys aware of things at sort of the more advanced level for interns? I've inter had interns both at Microsoft and now at Salesforce, and they are used as a recruiting pipeline. So are they paid internships as well? Are they undergraduates or graduate students? These are for graduate students. The oh. ones that the interns I've had were all grad students. Um, there are also, of course, undergrad positions, but they're they're very different in nature. Yeah, I think that, well, a, a grad student of mine did an internship at Tableau as a graduate student, and I think that um, we, yeah, I think faculty should be aware of those opportunities and encourage our students to take advantage. I think it's good for everyone. It, it isn't exactly an internship path per se, but one of the things that 
we're working on is a NOP grant that includes a postdoc who will be transitioning to industry with the first year of the salary paid by the grant. So this was something that was constructed specifically by the PI and uh, our company as part of a, uh, you know, bring a product through the development process and then out into industry. So, um, and then that person was uh, sought out as a, as a job advertisement that originally was posted as a postdoc job advertisement, uh, but then came with this extra bit that was attached to it. And, I don't know how common that is, but um, that might be something that people are interested uh, to look for specifically to see if the postdoc opportunities that have that kind of a tag on uh, on the end. Um, and I, I wanted to go back to the, um, the question about uh, experiences. Uh, don't discount your experiences leading into your degree as valuable for doing things after your degree in your postdoc. Uh, I had the fortune of spending a decade in the in the business before I you know coming back to academia to get my PhD and that definitely played a major role in where I am today so if you have those experiences and they were positive ones uh, make use of those um, even if it's just a philosophical standpoint like you know a colleague of mine in my second company said hey I think you should think about having an avocation and a vocation that are pretty well aligned so that the fun factor is high and that rings in my head every once in a while <laughs> about the things I do on a daily basis because it's fun and keeping that fun factor up there is important. That's really important. Okay, guys, you must have other questions out there, the attendees. There's not very many of you, so this is your chance. In the meantime, I can add another thing on the intern yeah. question. Uh, uh, I've, so I've had interns two of the last three summers and they've always been PhD students and we have a pretty small program. Most most tech companies do have some kind of intern program. Uh, usually though, it's for undergrads or grad students. Um, so I, I'm not aware of postdocs doing it, but I would say we also hire a lot of contractors. So if you have a specialized skill, um, say you're good at time series analysis or something, like if you know somebody at one of these companies and you think that your skill might be valuable, like just get in touch with them on LinkedIn or something. Um, we hire contractors all the time for specific projects and they're paid super well to like work on something for six months. Um, and it's really cool working with them too. So I have a question about um, post postdocs that are um, not US nationals and getting hired into companies like yours. Do you know um, how, you know, is that possible? Does that happen? Um, so I don't know if you guys could talk about that, about that trend for non-U.S. citizens? Definitely. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I actually, yeah, I don't even think they really consider that in the interview process. Um, you know, they are used to bringing in um, foreign nationals as employees. So, um, yeah, so it's, it's, yeah, it's something that they're used to dealing with and I, it, it isn't an issue. Okay, good. So we have about 10 minutes left. Um, oh wait, here's a couple more. Okay, uh, the first one from Dhruv again. Do you wanna uh, unmute yourself and ask that, Dhruv? Yeah, you know, everybody on this panel has said a lot of positive things about industry, but you know, are there things that you miss about academia or are there any general frustrations with industry that kind of make you wanna go back? Or maybe it's just great. <laughs> no, I can start. Um, I actually really miss science and answer, you know, I love answering science questions and I have a lot of passion for science still. Um, and, you know, I do miss that. Uh, and, you know, like when I talk to like colleagues that are still in academia, I can like totally nerd out about a scientific topic still. Like, you know, like I do really miss, you know, like working on like scientific questions. Um, and so, uh, I do miss that. Um, I, you know, so, but like, there's also a lot of positive things about industry as well. So like, yeah. Um, yeah. So I, you know, I, there, yeah. So I have my moments where, yeah, I'm definitely missing that. And the other thing I would also say I miss is like, um, sometimes, you know, like, you know, like 
you know, working on your own, working on your own projects is very different than an industry. Like I, I kind of like the teamwork aspect of industry, but also sometimes, you know, you just kind of want to like, Hey, this is a project that I'm working on and like walk it through the whole process. And that doesn't happen in industry as much. So, um, you know, just like those types of things. Well, one of the things, one of the things that I miss is sort of having the uh, time and ability and justification to to go to seminars and other departments to learn about things that you know you just it, even though I'm still near the university and technically could attend all those things I just don't have the time now and that's that is one of the things that I miss is is not being what I sort of considered to be plugged into a very wide intellectual community by being able to just pop off for an hour to atmospheric sciences and you know go to a seminar about some you know project that sounds interesting just can't do that now or not without a much more effort i do miss going down rabbit holes um i liked being able to like see something interesting and just chase it down and like try to come up with some like elegant explanation of it but i you know i do have to now make the assessment of like even if I did figure this out and explained it hundred percent, would it have any impact at all? And if the answer is no, then I don't, I don't go down a super long rabbit hole, even if it involves like cool equations that I like. <laughs> so um, the, one more question here. Have any of you written grants with co-PIs at any university to strengthen the industry try or maybe other kinds of collaborations? Um, at, at UW or elsewhere? I mean, Fritz, that's probably um, a relatively easy question for you because you're building instruments for pe people in um, academic oceanographic research. Yeah, that, it's, in fact, that's uh, relatively common in the, in the instrument business is for uh, research scientists to conclude that doing it themselves in their own lab is more expensive or more time consuming or more something that they don't have. And they reach out to a company to uh, collaborate. Um, and that's certainly the case with, with our company. So we have a number of um, academic and industry collaborations that are specific to uh, PIs that we work well, with. Including one with my husband, right? That's correct. <laughs> yes. Okay. Can, point can, out. Kelly, are there any academic ties with um, Rhodium Group? Yeah, there. So I have not written a grant, but there are like the senior manager of the Impact Lab projects has written grants with Impact Lab, uh, and the partner of, of the firm has written grants with the Climate Impact Lab. Um, there's like. I mean, I suppose to, to fund the lab itself, but then also one-off projects. Um, like we're doing something next year on wildfire risk that was written jointly with Rhodium and the Climate Impact Lab. So it does happen, but uh, I'm not, I haven't been involved at that level. Okay, we have a few more minutes for some, um, for any more questions that people have and you can raise your hand and you can unmute yourself and ask or ask in chat. Um, so maybe I'll ask um, the panelists one last thing from a sort of institutional perspective. Is there something that you think the College of the Environment should be doing or could be doing that would open up or daylight uh, opportunities in industry for our current postdocs and graduate students. Besides encouraging um, faculty to let their graduate students do internships, which I think is benefits everyone, but um, yeah. their ideas. I, yeah. So I think one, one thing uh, I would say is at least for me, when I started grad school, I sort of fell into the trap of just doing computational stuff at the same way my advisor did. You know, I sort of ad ad adopted all of his, um, all of his methodology, all his tools, which at the time was MATLAB mainly. And um, you know, when when I wanted to do things like learn how to use Git, I found I was the only person doing it, and you know, you don't learn very much that way. And similarly, like just didn't have traction to really spend time on like learning Python and things. So I think like because 
faculty members are role models for their students and students are going to follow in those footsteps. It's super helpful to, even if it's just learning Git or something like that, like give people a foothold to, um, to like learn some of the newer techniques. Um, or if you're not going to do it yourself, you know, just really encourage them to, to try some stuff, even if maybe you're not going to be able to, to give them the same amount of assistance with it because it's a new tool. Okay, I'm feeling the pressure, but uh, I know I need to learn Python. All of my students are using it. Okay, Kelly, go ahead. Were you going to say something? Yeah, I was going to say that um, this totally might have changed. This is probably changing. I graduated in 2013, so it's been a while now, but there's definitely this impression. It's more of like an attitude adjustment where it feels inferior to not go into academia because that's what all the faculty know is like, that's, you know, it's the assumption is that when you go get a PhD that you want to be in academia. And I think that's true for a lot of people entering, but I think that that's changing. And I think that it should feel okay to consider other things and it should not be looked at as a failure. Um, so just sort of, I don't know if it's, I don't know how to like facilitate that really. Maybe other people have ideas, but um, just making it okay to like consider other things and to, to decide to, you know, go into industry or whatever. That is like really helpful because it's not for everyone to stay. And also there's not enough jobs. <laughs> so. Well, and I think that academia benefits by the connections to industry and all totally. of the things yeah. that you guys have talked about, about how fast it things move, how projects have to be seen to the end. Um, learning new tools, all those things, I think are things that academics could get much better at. Jessica, did you wanna say something? Just some other things that haven't yet been mentioned. Um, there are surveys where they look at what are the top skills of data scientists. And I think they're um, mining LinkedIn or um, maybe CVs. I'm not quite sure, but just being aware of, you know, Python and Git are just so critical to the workflow and getting to know those tools ahead of time is, is very useful as, um, as Andy mentioned. Um, another thing would potentially be setting up um, mock interviews, things like this that, that give people an opportunity to understand, um, you know, where they might consider sort of refining their story or or um, get just getting feedback in general because it is a very different style of interviewing. Great. Um, any last sort of comments from the panel? Yeah, Allison. I just have ahead. a last comment in terms of something that hasn't been really brought up, but I've actually done some pro bono work, which has been kind of fun. Like, so you're at, a, you know, when you're in industry at a company, oftentimes, a DocuSign's really into trees. Um, so I've done some pro bono work helping this uh, nonprofit called Save the Redwoods. Um, and so I was, you know, like, you know, it's, it's fun because like you're basically contributing skills at this point, but um, it's just something that you might not think about when you're going into industry that there are opportunities like this where you learn all these new skills and then you can give back to maybe some of the, you know, causes that you really care about. Um, so I just wanted to mention that. That's cool. So those of you that are attending, please um, give some feedback on for the poll. There's a poll that's up now um, for the attendees um, about how helpful this panel was. Um, I found it super interesting. And yes, I am going to learn Python. So the next time um, when I get some time. Lillian, you've been right? saying that. You were going to do that during your sabbatical. I was I just going to say, I've heard that uh, like maybe a decade ago. Or Julia. Yeah. Well, I, as I said, all my grad students and, and postdocs use Python, so I'm not holding them back. Um, but it was super great to talk to all of you guys and, um, and really interesting. And I kind of wish that there were more faculty listening to this so we could see um, really see how satisfying a career outside of academia is for those that, that, that have lived the academic experience. Um, well, so, there's an idea for you then. Yeah, exactly. You invite the faculty to one of these. Yeah, or bring you, maybe bring a couple of you into a faculty meeting to talk about what you're doing now and how satisfying this is.
I, I do think that uh, continuing events like this for postdocs and continuing to encourage the postdoc community to to work with each other to develop you know skills and, and connections that might not otherwise come to bear because I do know that you know certainly as you get your degree and sometimes even in your postdoc you can get very narrowly focused on like here's this thing I've got to get done and and not reach out to people around you and that's really key. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Well, this is really great. Um, I think that's probably it. This is going to, this is, so it will be available for other people to listen to and watch. Um, thank you all to everyone. It was really great seeing you. And I think you gave some really good information for our current, current postdocs um, going forward. And I hope we'll stay in touch. Indeed. Thanks for organizing. Thanks for having us. Oh, thanks. Yeah, that's great.